Hello everyone, Rascal Entertainment's here. And Mama Entertainment's, welcome to our podcast. Today we're tackling a topic that hundreds of people can't help but talk about. The best villains of animated series. Now, just a heads up, there might be some great contenders that we may not cover here, either because we have different opinions or we just don't watch those shows. So if there are some villains you think we missed, name them in the comments. There is bound to be some because of all the cartoons out there. Right. So... We're going to talk today about the best villains of animated series. Yeah, and there's, like I said, there's quite a bit of them, but we had to very carefully pick the few that we enjoy seeing the most. Right, that made the most impression on us, that are the most memorable, and that have cool theme songs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so let's get this started. Okay, With so... number eight... Slade... From Teen Titans. Slade was not a joke. No. He was very, very dark for a kid's animated series. Right. And the character, of course, is, instead of calling him Deathstroke in here, it's just Slade. At the time, I didn't know who the character was. I thought that really was his name. It is, but there wasn't a villain name within the show. Right. And, yeah, for a show that's supposedly targeted for, what, seven and eight-year-olds, <laughs> he was kind of a really dark villain for a kid's show and i know it's dc they like going dark for all their shows but even before they hit that phase i mean this was like you said the guy was no joke no he they wasn't. out of all the rogues gallery they've had they've had kind of villains that wager from silly mm -hmm. and not much of a threat to major threats right. so they had a large assortment of them and slave was the one that just kept coming back right and uh, and robin was kind of obsessed with catching him and he was the most menacing the most threatening the most dangerous uh he was absolutely positively the worst villain they ever had on teen Titans. right so slade uh tell us a little more about, about tell us a little more about where he comes from uh from the comic book um, for the original source, of course, it has to be changed through each incarnation. For the show, he kind of comes up as the mystery villain mm -hmm. from the very beginning of the series as he's watching them each time and how they fight to what reveals his plans at the end of the first season. Mm -hmm. In the comics, he, um, there's kind of so many different versions, but the one that's the most recent that I know mm -hmm. that they kind of made out movie with Son of Batman mm -hmm. will be the one where he was fighting for power with Ra's al Ghul. Right. And, Which we own. Right, we own that movie, and he wanted his dojo. He had the League of Assassins. Mm -hmm. He's pretty much just taking over. Mm -hmm. Now, the story behind that I'm not familiar with because either I haven't read the comic or because the movie did not explain that part mm -hmm. because we have not read that, but... No matter it, what incarnation he's in, mm -hmm. he's always threatening and menacing. They made sure not to make him Sugar weak. Sugarcoat it right. and make it like a right. Teen Titans Go slave. Right, he's slave not even... is dangerous. I mean, in this particular uh, show, he's really dangerous. And never at any time um, did you think he was good or there mm -hmm. was good in him. No. And there's definitely no redemption arc in this show for mm -mm. Slade. No, definitely not. Because also in the first season, at the end of it, you found he wanted Robin as an apprentice. Right. Because especially of all the times he fought Batman, who's not in the universe. He's Well, he exists in, in that universe, but he's just not shown because this show focuses on all the so-called sidekicks mm -hmm. of the DC universe. So he kind of wanted like his own Robin. So just take Batman's apprentice and make him his own right. to do what he wants. Right. Now, and, uh, tell us who is he voiced by? Uh, oh, actually, unfortunately I don't know because he was <gasps> not a well-known, uh, actor. Usually with this show, they have qu quite a few well-known people. But for this one, they actually had one that wasn't as well-known in animation, mm -hmm. but he was very well done in portraying the character. So if any of you know, because we didn't look this up. Yeah, I sure did. Uh, and Sorry never thought about it to right now. Let us know who voices Slade in Teen Titans. Right, because he was definitely had the menacing voice. Oh, definitely. He fit the character very well and delivered the minds very just awesomely. Cause so. It made you believe he really was this dark right. villain. So let's tell what makes Slade memorable. And our um, number 18 Titans. Okay. And um, for me, it's because he was very tough for Robin to beat. And, right. you know, Robin had some really mad skills being mm -hmm. taught by Batman. But he was really, really difficult to beat. Right. And he was always a challenge for Robin. In one instance, 
it was good on one side for Robin because it honed his skills. It made him a better fighter. It made him a better leader because he learned how to, uh, how villains could be really calculating, really dark, and how to outsmart opponents. Mm -hmm. So from that viewpoint, Slade helped to make Robin better in Teen Titans. But on mm -hmm. the flip side, Slade was pretty, pretty horrible right. and pretty, pretty bad. And there were no depths that he wouldn't sink to to get what right. he wanted. And as you said, that was making Robin his right. apprentice. Especially when he wanted Tara too. But we are not going to disclose of what happened. But what happened in the comic between him and Tara was really, really messed up. And, we're... and they could not do that in this kid's show. So they just had where she became his apprentice and left it at that. Yeah, and we're just going to talk about what makes him memorable as a villain. Right. And you can the... research that yourself. I think the fact that... He was the one villain that usually superhero shows have where there's one that just keeps coming back. Just like Batman has the Joker that comes back consistently. Mm -hmm. Slade came back consistently throughout all the uh, throughout the show. Mm -hmm. Every time he thought he was gone, he'd come back. Every time he thought he was gone, he came back. And he was, as you said, very hard to beat, mm -hmm. even with all of them together. I think Absolutely. only one time they beat him and he had to run off. Right. But... Oh, uh, no, nah, he was incredible. Like, even with just one or all of them, he was hard to beat. And he didn't even have any powers, and he was tough to beat. So if you haven't seen Teen Titans before, or if you just want to refresh or just get the episodes, if you don't own them like we do on disc, mm -hmm. just look for the episodes that feature Slate, and just watch the Slate episodes, and you will just be floored by the type of villain he was and the writing and how this really, really was very dark for what probably would have been deemed a TY7, as I tell right. you, that means uh, they told you why. <laughs> um, this character really was not right for a children's animated series, right. but it but they made had it to a make better it show. Yeah, and they had to make it work. And it worked. So, now we'll move on to number seven. Mojo Jojo from the original Powerpuff Girls. Only the original because the new one, he's kind he's of a, a joke. wuss. <laughs> he's a joke. He's a joke. <laughs> so Mojo Jojo um, was a creation of the professor prior to him making the Powerpuff Girls. And he had him in his little diaper. And he was in the lab with him. Oh dear. And he treated him like he was, I guess, his favorite pet. He didn't mm -hmm. treat him like a son, but his favorite right. pet. And he became jealous after he made the Powerpuff Girls, and he kind of got banished, or not, he didn't really get banished, he no. left on his own. Yeah, through the accident. He and, That's how he got the giant brain that's covering his head, through the accident, and he ran off. The results in his evil. So, tell us okay. a little more about Mojo Jojo. Okay, but the original series, prior to a movie, that he was kind of come up as the, once again, the villain that comes up consistently. And he always had the trait of repeating things two or three times in different ways. <laughs> and you realize you just said the same Aye, thing. Aye, Mojo Jojo. Right. Aye, <laughs> Mojo Jojo. <laughs> and even for the first episode, his first appearance, he was a threat, but he was also a joke at the same time. It just depends on the situation. Right. Some episodes, he was kind of a joke. It's like, plan of the week, he fails. Plan of the week, he fails. Plan of the week, he fails. And then there will be sometimes we actually Actually is close to winning, winning right. and he is a bigger threat depending on what he what his tactics are. Now I think his least threatening episode is the one where he babysat the girls. Right, he and was just at their at their mercy. He's like, forget about taking over Townsville. I just want to rest. And they tortured him horrendously and had him watching this TV show with a Barney like character. And every time there was an animal, if there's a bunny, <laughs> hop 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 hop, and they would bang on the floor with their feet. So now, I think the most threatening episode of where he really achieved his plans was the one where he turned everyone in Townsville into dogs. Right, and I was in the pilot mm -hmm. when he took this uh, statue and put these two little gems in it and it could transform everybody into a dog. Right. Even the narrator wasn't <laughs> immune to it. He wasn't even within the show. Right. 
And yeah, it was first appearance, so they pretty much basically told you what the character is all about mm -hmm. in the very first episode. And then down the line, you see how his plans go and how he thinks that he's a genius, but all his plans fail because it's Mojo Jojo. So in the one where he turned everyone into dogs, mm -hmm. he got some type of ancient stone uh -huh. that powered this machine, right? Uh, right, it was a statue, and then he plugged the machine, and then air around the world would turn the dogs and obey him. I said Townsville. No, I forgot. It, it, it affected the world. That's why his plan succeeded, and right. he was... He's on our number seven because this was a pretty big plan right. where everyone on Earth turned into a dog. Right, and then it was first appearance and he already won. It's like, mm -hmm. wow. And then I think his most, his other most threatening one was when they had an origin story. They had a Powerpuff Girls movie mm -hmm. that was released in theaters to show how were the girls created mm -hmm. and they ended up becoming the heroes of the city. Right. The movie didn't do well in box office, but it did well with fans of the show. Right. And it kind of showed how he started, how he actually befriended them at first. Mm -hmm. And then once he got them to do what he wanted, he kind of freed all the apes of towns, all the primates. And he kind of free, freed all of them. And he had them take over the town. Mm -hmm. And then up to a point where the apes, they wanted to take over the town because they were all just as smart as him. So right. they all had his personality. He was getting really angry. And, and they eventually, were all different versions yeah, of Mojo. Yeah. Some with a big nose. Yeah. Some that were really tiny. Right. Some that were really huge. Oh, yeah. But Mojo. they all were dressed like him in some version of Mojo. Like, I am so-and-so. I am so-and-so. I am so-and-so. I was like, hey, no, I am Mojo. Jojo. And, and that's the into... only reason the plan didn't work right. because they all started battling against him. Right. And then the the climax with him turned into just pretty much King Kong, mm -hmm. and he was really was at his highest peak of villainy, mm -hmm. where he had taken over the town, everything was destroyed, I know he had monkeys everywhere, <laughs> but he, that's the other time he was really powerful, and that was before he even became the main antagonist prior to the series. Right. I think one more that also showed the lengths that he would go to with planning mm -hmm. a takeover, and he would always have these elaborate plans that would take forever, and had all these millions of steps required to get it done. Right. Was the one where he switched all the bodies of all the people in Townsville. Oh yeah, the crisscross cries of right. my favorite episodes. Yes, and Buttercup was stuck as the professor, Blossom was stuck as Miss Bellum, and Bubbles was stuck as the mayor. But they still had their power, so you were just kind of seeing the ordinary people fight. Mm -hmm. So all these people that were kind of, like, they were friends, now they're enemies, and everyone was just all mixed up, and it looked like something out of a Where's Waldo puzzle. So he would succeed in his plans, and yes, he wasn't as threatening as Slade. He was nowhere near Slade, but Slade ended up our number eight because the show was gone and over and mm -hmm. can never come back. And that's one reason Mojo is also at number seven. Right. Because the original Mojo can't come back. And yeah, at times he was seen as a joke, but there were many, many times right. during this series run that his plans worked, mm -hmm. that he caused, he wreaked havoc, he caused trouble. Right. And, it, and there were a couple of times where he really, really seemed like he was scary right. um, to us as well as to the Powerpuff Girls. So and that's why Mojo's number seven. Right. For us. And the last thing I want to mention, one of my favorite episodes with him is it, besides the crisscross crisis one, will be the one where he kind of crashed their, or their slumber party. He dressed up as Mojo. Moisha Jones and Mo returning Moisha Moisha and no one figured it out except for the Powerpuff Girls like it's clearly obvious it's him but everyone else was like oh no and they kept thinking he was gonna turn and he was actually being nice and he made a good tea time. and cookies and <laughs> you found out later he did he did have a plan to get rid of him but it looked like he was having a lot of fun doing this I forgot about and the plan. plan and he finally snuck out and yeah, they never addressed it but I think he was just having so much fun with them he waited till they were asleep to put his plan into action. It was actually pretty funny and clever. Yes, that's one of the, you are right, that's one of the best episodes that he's in in TakeOver. And in the end, the girls of Townville saved, saved the day, so that right. was a nice twist. Right. <laughs> so now on to number six. Van Kleiss from Generator Rex. And he's got his own awesome theme song and i love it i love it i even used it in one of my halloween intros from a few years back it was just that good it sounds like this like king of king of the end of the world type of music that's what it sounds to me and it's just really epic now generator rex was, is actually one of our favorite shows uh created by the same people that created ben 10 man of action and uh, tell me a little more about Generator X and how Van Kleist uh, became uh, a villain. 
right. that was to be contended with, right. and he wasn't a joke either. Right. Now, like Mojo, he was introduced in the very first episode of the series, and he first offered himself as to be someone that could help him, like someone who was like him as an Evo, or people that had nanites in them, and only his was more advanced. And it turns out he just wanted Rex for his nearly endless supply of nanites so he could have power. And that was pretty much the goal of him just about the entire series was just capturing Rex and then using him as an endless power supply of nanites and pretty much using the planet as domain for this other world full of evils and pretty much take over the earth with it and have an endless supply of power. And he was also responsible for the disappearance of Rex's parents. Right. Yeah, you find a way down the line that the these two, he and along with another villain, worked with uh, Rex's parents, and they were. And this is how it all started before the nanite exposure started, mm -hmm. and they're pretty much the, he's part of the reason why it caused it in the first place. Exactly. And then knowing that Rex was there, Harvin was just looking for him, so he knew he had that power, and he's the only one that could cure Evo. So why not just harness all that so he just has all the power? Now, unlike Slade and Mojo Jojo, Ben Kleist had this really, really kick-ass, is the only way to put it, uh, assistance, you call him or his, his uh, or, yeah, entourage could, yeah. that worked with him that was uh, Firewolf. Yeah, he was this, and, like, a mechanical werewolf. He was the toughest one of them. And Breach, uh -huh. and it was Cer Cersei, uh, yeah, and Scalamander, and, and all, every single one of these uh, these. Uh, people that worked with them were villains in their own right and every single one was a threat. Right. So even if they weren't working with him, he could they could still put up a fight on their own. And he would call them together when he really had some big elaborate plan he needed done or when he knew that he was on the losing end, he would drag them in in order to try to overpower Rex and Six and uh, end up winning. But a lot of times he didn't, but there were some cases where he succeeded in his point. Right. And it was kind of like the opposite of Rex, as Rex can cure people with nanites, mm -hmm. and you'll know, take the nanites away and they transform back to human. Mm -hmm. Van Kleist could make people right. evils, just touch them, they get infected, mm -hmm. and Rex can heal them. So it was kind of like a back and forth. Like there's one person that can heal them and one person that can that can harm them. Mm -hmm. So it was coming back and forth until the very end right. when everyone gets cured. He was the threat that no one could stay cured. Right. And this is another villain where the show has been, the story's been finished and the show is over. Mm -hmm. So there are no spoilers. Um, as far as we know, there's not a reboot or anything coming Surprisingly, back. Surprisingly, no. And there should be. I mean, I know Generator Rex ended the way that the writers wanted it to end, but I think the show should have just gone on. It was mm -hmm. such an awesome and great right. show. Right, even without those nanite story, you still saw that Kleist got away and he was right. kind of really damaged. You want to see how did how will the other uh, characters look now that they're cured. Exactly. And what's he what's he going to fight now? What's going to be this new threat now? Nanites are gone and say they're still going to be villainy. Mm -hmm. So is he going to be like a more superhero-like character mm -hmm. or what was going to happen after that? But I kind of see why they ended it anyway. And we can also say with Van Kleist, with Slade, he was just pure evil. With Mojo, as I said, you had it back and forth. And I think now we probably should have had Mojo number 8 and Slade 7. But that being said, mm -hmm. Van Cl you see a move up in the characters we're choosing where they become more intelligent mm -hmm. and they become better at planning right. and executing uh, those plans in order to right. succeed. They're pretty much getting more development as the heroes. Mm -hmm. Whether they have a redemption arc or not, they're getting better at their plans as series goes along. As we've seen like Gravity Falls or Star right. or the other shows, they're starting to improve. I meant in terms of our list, but I agree. But oh. in terms of our list, you can see with Van Kleist, the beginning of the villains that we're choosing toward number one mm -hmm. are getting more and more uh, intelligent, as I said, mm -hmm. more intricate in detail and and even better at pretending to be a friend, All putting right. on a, a face and making the protagonist yeah, the of the, making yeah. the right, making the protagonist think that they are befriending them mm -hmm. when actually they are backstabbing them at the same time. Right. And Van Kleist was very, very adept at doing that. There were a few times that he kind of made people think that he was trying to help, right, that like he when was he, trying to change things, and he wasn't. Right, like when he wanted his domain to be recognized at his own country, and he, right. he just wanted to take over America. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
And that was the, was at the time the Rex wore a uh, sixes suit. Yeah, and party was one of the best yeah. episodes. <laughs> it's one of the best episodes. But Van Kleist, definitely he's memorable. And again, as we say, he has an awesome theme song. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, we should mention that everyone who has a theme song, you hear it playing in the background. Now oh yeah, as we're talking. Well, I might want to pay attention too. So Van Kleist uh, earned our number six because of the. Strength of the writing for the character, the development of the character. Again, he had this uh, pretty impressive uh, group of other villains that assisted him. Mm -hmm. uh, at one time, he was a friend to the parents of the protagonist, right. and he became an enemy, mm -hmm. and he became a really, really strong villain. And really, out of all the, the cartoons that we've watched and animated movies, I haven't seen any villain that even comes close to being like Van Kleist. That's true. He is a very unique villain. Very, very unique. And that is why he made our list as one of the best villains of animated series. All right. Now, on to number five. I've Lord Dominator for Wander Over Yonder. Oh, man. Now, finally, we got another female, the first female villain on the list. That's right. And she is... One bad villain. Right. Which is why she had to make this list. Right. And she came in at the beginning too. Well, who was who was uh, Dominator voice? By? Uh, I think her name was Noelle Wells. If okay. I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, now she came in at the second season of One, which unfortunately was the last, and was meant to be this bigger threat than Hater. And Hater just wanted to take over Planet Group. He was the greatest in the galaxy. However, Dominator was the opposite. She wanted to destroy everything. everything, every planet, every planet in there. She took over, then blew up, and leaving the residents to find shelter somewhere else. And the scary part is, she just about did destroy the universe. At the with, end of the series. Right. Oh, so with only one planet left that every character from the show had to be sent to this one secret planet that she right. didn't know about because she really did succeed in pretty much destroying the galaxy. Absolutely. And it's like, that's a shock because that never happens. They Usually they come close and it doesn't happen. But no, as the series goes on, she gets closer and they take over and they're, they're trying to figure out a way to beat her because she's almost invincible. Now, in case you haven't watched Wanda Over Yonder, it's the journeys of this cute little alien and his horse, Sylvia, as they travel the galaxy in his magic hat. And they pretty much do good deeds wherever they go. Right. Um, Make Dominator is one of two villains, as you mentioned, Lord Dominator and Lord Hater. Mm -hmm. And both of them are after Wander uh, to destroy him. Right. Except for Lord Hater... Uh, in the beginning is very threatening but he falls in love with Lord Dominator uh -huh. and then suddenly he loses his edge and becomes just a source of uh, humor yeah. and laughter and, and fodder for Wander, mm -hmm. who just wants to be his friend. Right. Because... And, he's trying to, and he's trying to fight that the entire series, right. too. Because, like, no, I'm not going to be your friend no matter what. He's still trying to be his friend instead of rather fighting him. And now, and there were times that Wander did succeed in doing nice things for Hater and getting niceness out of Hater and Peoples. And as Peepers. Well, and Peepers as well. Peepers. It's Peepers. But. With Lord Dominator, it didn't happen. Right. I mean, there was just no chance, and there was just no chance at all that she would do it. Right. Now, there was only one episode in which you saw a different side to Lord Dominator, mm -hmm. and that's when she was out and uh, met Sylvia at a party. Yeah. At a club. Yeah, she was in disguise. She was, the computer had to update. You know, it sits and takes 100 years to update. Well, she went out while it was updated, and she went in disguise and manure, and then she met with Sylvia, and they ended up actually having like, yes, a girl's night out. Yes, the horse went at, to a club and had a girl's night out. <laughs> yeah, it was a girl's <laughs> night out episode, and they actually did have a good time until mm -hmm. it kind of And you got to see end. a different side of Dominator. You got to see she could get along with people if she wanted to right but that there's a side of her to, her to her that she doesn't trust anyone and we never find out why right and that side emerges um for no good reason she just suddenly thinks sylvia's out to get her and she turns on her yeah and it's said friends it's said you can't just tell your friends what to do mm -hmm. that's not how that works and that's what kind of what made her turn again because mm -hmm. it's it would come like they're not your slaves they're your subjects they're right. your friends and she didn't get that and then that and side of her that's always there, 99% of the time, right. came back. back the and it was back to business as usual. Right. She went back to her ship and again tried to destroy right. 
um, the planet that they right. have been on. And what was also different for this villain is when you have a villain like this, like with Van Clyde or a slave, they usually don't play around when they're these serious types of villains are out to destroy everything. Mm -hmm. No, she was kind of different. She was still out to destroy everything, but she kind of reveled in it. Mm -hmm. She was happy about She was so crazy. Right. She she was happy about doing this. She always had the same as Sandy as Hater, only in only worse off. And she didn't and like she, him at all. She right. didn't that was do weird. with him. She had no relationships. She had no friends. She had nobody helping her. Right. She was, was alone. Right. And they said maybe that's why she turned evil. She's like, well, you're lonely. You don't have anybody on this ship. Mm -hmm. All your subjects are robots. Mm -hmm. She has nobody else on there. Like, maybe no wonder she turned evil. And well, of course, she didn't get into that because the show was canceled. But, uh, yeah, she... Uh, they they also had like a whole musical episode of My Fair Lady yes. and a great episode right and they're trying to get Hater to ask her out and the whole time when she finally got to her segment she got her own song mm -hmm. that pretty much told you that she's not here to make friends I'm not your friend I'm not down in the strip I'm not a princess I'm the bad guy mm -hmm. and that's how it's gonna be and you pretty much got right there and there there's mm -hmm. no chance of something else happening in the show right. she is the villain and she's here to stay and I think because she was alone on the ship like you said that allowed her to hone her evilness right i mean there was no one to distract her nothing to distract her uh nothing uh no small talk no right. taking a day off except for that one day with sylvia right all she was doing was honing her plan of evil domination right. of destroying everything existed but you wonder did it ever you ha, ha wonder did it ever occur to her if you destroy everything, what are you, else are you going to destroy? Right. What are you going to rule? There'll be nothing and no one. And what are you going to do there? Right. You, you don't have any food. You won't have any, you're just going to be in there on your ship. And she kind of thought about it like after the end, but then she still went back in anyway and right. said, huh, I did it. I destroyed the galaxy. Now what I do? And now she's bored because she destroyed everything. So now she's kind of at a loss of what to do till she finds the planet. And at the very end of the series, when you see after the end credits, mm -hmm. There was supposed to be a third season, and she was supposed to come back. Mm -hmm. But there was also going to be one more villain that was supposedly worse than her. Mm -hmm. So she was going to come back for revenge, plus a villain that was even bigger than her, which may force her to team up with them. And that would have been really interesting to see, because she was, like I said, she right. was pretty bad. And I mean, everyone she kept was. saying, who's going to be worse than worse Dominator? Than her, right. You couldn't wait to find out, but it got canceled, unfortunately, for no explained reason. They just said, we don't need any more episodes. So you ne well, unless it comes back miraculously, there's no way you're going to find out who was going to be this next villain that was so bad she would have to team up with them, or there could be a chance for her to be redeemed. Now, Disney, if you're listening, we believe in miracles. Please bring back Wander Over Yonder for that final third season. There are probably literally uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of us, really wanting to see yeah, the end of this the story. Yeah, they got the petition ready, too. We really want to see the end of this story. We want to see what would have happened. We want to see um, if there's a connection between Wander and and Lord Dominator and Lord Hater because it was inferred that there yeah. was some type of relationship. Maybe even they were related. So we mm. really would like to see that unfold. Right. They kind of made a joke about it with the fan theories. So, Lord Dominator, for that reason, is our number five. And we are very happy that there's a woman on this list. Right. Now, number four... ...is... Toffee from Star vs. the Forces of Evil. Another one who is not to be played with. And you will see from number four through one, we get to villains who really We're hardcore. are master, hardcore and masterminds. Right. Now for Toffee, he was introduced in the early first season. And some people say that the show was kind of meh. Let's depend on some other people until Toffee was introduced and we got a villa and then the story finally started to unfold after you got used to the characters. And he worked with Ludo to help him get the wand because Ludo was in need of an assistant because he kept failing over and over because his monsters kept getting their butts kicked. So throughout the show, the first season, he kept coming up with plans for him to get the wand. And each time you were seeing a little bit more of Toffee and what he really wanted to do because by the end of the season he had pretty much kicked Ludo out of his own castle took over his minions got uh, uh, captured Marco forced Ma started to give up her wand and destroy it these are one of the again one of the few villains that actually succeeded in his plans because in the first season he actually made her give up the wand and destroy it which you couldn't figure out why and then when you thought he was gone he 
it turned out he was inside the one controlling Ludo who had lost everything, could have right. got him back to power and kind of almost mentally possessing him. I was like, dang, how are you doing this? Then in the third season, he finally comes back and all that time he just wants his finger back right. because Luna shot up there in a flashback episode, which you'll see. And throughout the entire time, he is nothing but a major threat to, to not be Everyone trifled with. in the entire series, right. especially in Muni, where he's even a threat to Earth. Right. So they had to get him away from Earth back to Muni. Right. And in the last season before he was killed off and people were kind of upset I don't think he's over. killed off before he's gone for now. And I kind, I kind of thought he was killed because how else could the deal with Eclipse be made? If Tavu was destroyed, she'd be set free. So that had to mean he was gone. That's why people can say, are you sure he's I gone? I still think he's going to come back. I don't think. There's no way in heck they've made this type of mastermind powerful um villain that's made this impression this is a villain that even and this is where we start beginning with villains that have their own fan base right toffee has a huge fan base yes. there's no way that they're going to write toffee off this show and he's not coming back and i think this is just going to be a testament to just how uh powerful right. and wicked he is toffee is coming back also revealed he's immortal so he's been going around since but even before Moon was a child, mm -hmm. he has been around for hundreds of years. He had his own army. Mm -hmm. He killed Moon's mother. So it turned out that he was worse off. And people found out because before people were kind of wondering, who is this character? He was just a big mystery for people. Mm -hmm. And some people thought he knew Moon, which they got right. But they kind of thought it was a friend turned enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, they were way off, but it was a good idea as admitted by the creator. And from there, it just kept building up and building up. And once you found out what was about him, then people really were, like, ugh, freaked out by him. It's like, now now people are saying he's a really messed up villain. He's terrifying to them now. Now, I think we need to mention that Toffee is voiced by the star of Dexter. Mm -hmm. Michael C. Hall. And he's based off of a character Christian Bell actually portrayed in a movie called um, American Psycho. Thank you. Oh, a brain fart. American Psycho, which uh, Rascal definitely hasn't seen, but I don't want to see that. No, you don't. And I've seen because Christian Bell is one of my favorite actors. But the character in this movie was not uh, nowhere for kids, nowhere for anyone under twenty one. This was a wicked, wicked character. And by taking, basing him off that character and voicing him with someone who was a, a serial killer of serial killers, Toffee was meant to be a very, very wicked and um, powerful character. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no way you're putting these different uh, tropes together and he's meant to be lighthearted. There's nothing right. in Toffee that's lighthearted. There's no episode where he's lighthearted. No. There's no episode where he... Uh, really loses because he's coming yeah, back. Yeah, he wins there's, every time they fight him just about till the end. And there's no episode in which he he cracks jokes or he's friendly Except to the protagonist. <laughs> and he's friendly with the protagonist. There's none of that with this character. There's no. none of this with Toffee. Toffee is the beginning on this list of really, really dangerous villains. Mm -hmm. And that is why he's memorable and that's why he's number four. And we really can't wait to see more of what he does on the show when the season returns. Yeah. And in gosh. season four because Come I, on. Because qu quote me, trust me, Toffee will be back. Okay. Now on to our number three, another woman. Azula from Avatar The Last Airbender and she is yet again another one that's not to be trifled with which is why she makes number three Azula Azula well, I mean what else can you say if you've seen the show you just know how determined demented wicked and villainous she is from and, the time she's on there to the very end of the series. And it was a contrast to how she looked. They made her this beautiful woman, and she's from a family of beautiful people. There's no other way to tell it. And you first see her, and you're like, oh, it's Zuko's sister. Oh, she's beautiful. And you're thinking there's going to be some type of redemption arc, or she's going to be a character who's underneath. She's good, and there's good in her, but there's not a chance in heck that Azula ever was or ever will be good. Mm. ever 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 she is strong she is 
intelligent she is calculating and she's another one of those villains who has a way of giving you the impression that I'm on your side mm -hmm. and I really like you and you help me and I'll help you no you'll help her but there's no way she's gonna help you yeah and her her one goal was to become the fire lord and her dad become the phoenix king I was like oh boy that title <laughs> but she, you just saw the amount of um depravity in azula and you you know that it came from fire lord ozan there's no way it came ozai. from anyone but fire lord ozai um <laughs> it came from him and she uh sorry and it was definitely um an inherited mental disorder yes definitely and especially with like we were the very end of the final episode like when she had that the breakdown with the mirror and she saw her mom and we mean mental disorder yes. in the terms of uh like someone being uh psychotic right and especially the pinnacle of that happening when she was completely gone was in the final the four part series finale mm -hmm. and uh it was with the mirror scene. If anyone's seen the show, you remember that part when mm -hmm. she had seen her mother. Right. And she kinda wanted her mother's love, but she was just so crazy that she put her distance away from her. She cared more she about was, getting her daddy's love and impressing him. Right. Than the mom. She really didn't to me, mm -hmm. she was more interested in the dad and Zuko was the mama's boy. There's no right. way to put it. Because he was softer and kinder like her right. before you know, the um, Agni Kai with his dad and what happened. That's, that's but true. he was more like the mom. But mm -hmm. I can see where you were saying, right. in a way, she did want it, but only because she was competing with Zuko. Right. She didn't really want it because she wanted her to love her. She right. wanted it so that she would have both parents' affection. Right. That's the way it looked And then, and, and, and with, during that scene, when she's saying, well, you think I'm a monster? No, I really do love you, mm -hmm. but you need to stop this. Like, this last bit of sanity right. through the vision of her mother was coming out. Like, you need to stop this because you're right about to go over the edge. Mm -hmm. And but then it was already too late. Right. And that became obvious when... Um, she had left and the next morning they woke up and she was gone and it's a big long story we don't need to go through mm -hmm. but Azula told Zuko well now you don't have mom here to protect you mm -hmm. so she really was only competing with him for the mom's affection she right. really didn't care right. she was glad she was gone because then she could torture Zuko the way she ended up doing you know the rest of that childhood right. she would also trick him into thinking oh Zuzu I'm for you. <laughs> oh, name. Zuzu, I support you. Oh, Zuzu. Zuzu. But she didn't love Zuko. No, she, she didn't. loved no one. She didn't even love the Fire Lord. No. She just wanted his approval so that she could uh, have the get title. that title. But I really believe if that story had continued, there would have been some point that Azula would have probably backstabbed and killed her dad if given the opportunity. Right. She will become Phoenix, I guess, Phoenix Queen. Right. So, again, she was not to be trifled with. Zula is madly wicked. And, again, she's one of these characters and villains. There's no one since her that is like her in any animated series. And, right. and many male have or tried. Female. Exactly. Yeah, male or female. Exactly. And many have tried, but nothing comes close to the character that Azula was. Mm -hmm. um, this was just awesome writing, amazing character development, and making a memorable character that years and years later, here we are still talking about her right. as being a, a humongous threat that if you put her in shows with other characters uh, and other villains, Azula would have beaten them out. Azula would beat Toffee. Azula would beat Dominator. Mm -hmm. Azula would have beaten Kleist. Azula would have crushed and stomped on Mojo. Azula and Slade, I'd love to see it, but I guarantee mm -hmm. you in the end, that would be one fight Slade would lose. Mm -hmm. I think that pretty much sums it up for Azula throughout the entire series. You see that she is a big threat from beginning to end to everybody, not just the heroes, but the so-called villains, right. too. She will betray anybody. So that's why she is... Our number and, three. And yeah. our second woman on our uh, list of best villains of animated series. Now on to number two. Chase Young from Shaolin Showdown. Chase Young. And he's pretty underrated in terms of villainy. Because you got all these villains from big time franchises, whether they're live action or animator or movies and shows. No one seems to talk that much about Chase Young, but he still has the following within the fandom. Years later after the show's uh, been canceled. Right. And if you've listened to our podcast on Shaolin Showdown, Right, we did. We did discuss how he 
change the status quo of the show, especially with the interactions with Omi and Jack Spicer and how he became such a big threat in that show. And it it really is, it, he really is another, like I said, another underrated villain in terms of, you know, being known. Because like some of these other villains on our list, he's very calculative. And also, with the amount of the rogues gallery they had in Challenge Showdown, he was probably the most powerful one of all. Mm -hmm. Even though they had one that turned him evil like Hamble Bean, mm -hmm. Chase was still a very formidable opponent, mm -hmm. both to the heroes, once again, to the heroes and the villains. It will be the type of villain where you're forced to team up with your enemies to take him down because he's too big for one person to handle by themselves. Right. Now, up to this point... He's our oldest villain. He's over 1,500 years old. Right. Still looks like uh, a teenager. But during this time, he's had this opportunity to, again, um, like Van Kleist, to have this humongous uh, assistance in all of these villains he's just uh, collected over the centuries mm -hmm. who are just as evil and intelligent and calculating and brilliant as he is, but he's the leader. There, make no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. He is the leader of mm -hmm. you know this this cast of villains. Right. And he was another one, kind of like Slade. He was hard to beat because mm -hmm. he can match move, match move for move. No moves you never even heard of. Pull out powers you don't have. And during the course of this series, Chase Young never was beaten. He deliberately lost to Omi in one of the. Um, episodes the showdowns remember yes. he deliberately lost to him and in the end um he didn't lose he actually was wanting them to win because if you see the two-part finale of the what ended up being the series finale mm -hmm. he wanted them to win so technically in this show chase young never lost a battle with anyone right he because he is like i said a really 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 hard villain to be and it's a shame that he's not doesn't have more recognition among best villain lists they always go for movies or for even disney because there's a ton of disney villains people mention mm -hmm. but it's a shame that he's not mentioned on lists whether uh disney or not because he definitely earns a place on it oh definitely and just like the other villains we've chosen on our list he's distinct mm -hmm. there's another villain out there like him and there have been other shows who have tried to duplicate the success of Chase Young. Right. Again, here's another villain who has a large fandom, as you right. mentioned, that still is going on years later after the show has ended. He was voiced by Jason Marston. And whenever he goes to Comic-Cons, people want to hear him do the Chase Young right. voice years and years later. But just the testament to not only the writing, but the um, performance of the voice actor and having you not only um, identify him as a villain, but also understand that, like, Zuko in Avatar, you know that there's good still left in Chase Young where he can possibly go back and be a good mm -hmm. guy and rather than just be a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And we forgot to tell who Azula was voiced by. Uh, Gray Griffin. The great Gray Griffin. Yeah, and Chase Young is voiced by Jason Marsden. So... Um, we're not going to talk too much about Chase because you'll find out a whole lot more about him in the Shaolin Showdown podcast. So now, this moves us on to our number one best villain of animated series. Prince Lotor from Voltron Legendary Defender. My father built our empire on the bones of his enemies. The universe can no longer doubt our strength, while those who continue to stand against us will be crushed. And even though he's fairly new to the villains list, he's still very memorable. As you know, Voltron is based off a uh, 80s show and is a reboot. Well, he was featured in the original, but and even though he was supposedly a threat to the characters, he did not seem like one when you watched him. He was a joke and a sad excuse for a villain, and I'm so glad that they right. just upped the game with him in this right. reboot. Being that it's a reboot, they have had to change that, and of course the writing is different now. Right. So instead of him being the type of villain where he looks like a threat and he really isn't, he truly was a threat, and a little bit like Chase Young, very calculative. Um, he was persuasive, charismatic. He is, he's still on. 
<laughs> I was going to say, what? No, he's like still alive, and the show is still on, so he is still um, the villain of the show right now. Right. And I'm he, sorry, next to his daddy. Right, over the Zarkon, yeah. And, yeah, he was he's another one that's pretty tough to be. There's even been theories that there were that he's too smart for Voltron, because if they face him by themselves, or even with Voltron, there's no way they can beat him, because right. he seems to know what they're going to do, or know what options they have to choose, and know which one they're going to do before they even have a chance to do it. It's like he's reading their minds. Now, the way he's designed, they made him pretty. They voiced him. They voiced him by AJ Luskasko. If I'm mispronouncing the name, I'm sorry. And he has this way of speaking that just draws all the uh, the Gaura into listening to him and siding with him. And the way he looks, he's. They say that he's small for being half Gaura, so they don't think he's a threat. But his fighting skills and his sword skills and are just impressive. And the way that he handles uh, flying his ship and his uh, fighter ship as well is just impressive. No one can outfly him, no one can outmaneuver him, and so far to date in Voltron, no one has beaten him. He, and as you mentioned, it looks like he can't be beaten. Even his own father who put out a hit on him and said that he was to be killed on sight, he outmaneuvered his daddy, all the daddy's minions, all the daddy's uh, Gaara soldiers, he even outsmarted his own all-female generals who decided to turn on him when the dad said that he was to be killed on sight. They thought they would get favor with his dad if they uh, turned him in. So they were dumb enough to hit this guy over the head, knock him out, and handcuff him. Now, this is what makes him one of the most memorable and most threatening and most calculating and intelligent villains of all times. Tell them what happens when they handcuff this guy to a chair and put him in his own darn ship to take him to his daddy. Okay, after delivering him there, they told him and said, we're just, we're, you know what we had to do. They said, you do what you must, and I'll do what I must. And he kind of took, he just took his arm, kind of took his arms all the way back from his, from his, uh, uh, his from back. behind his back, yeah. handcuff, and, and like fresh. double, triple joints. Yeah, that, you could hear it cracking, and he got free of the cuffs and drove off in the ship. By and putting him the, in the arms dance. from his back over his head to the front right. and then breaks the cuffs. I was like, what the, like, what the heck? And then, and then he just takes off. It's like, how the heck did you, he, that's almost like a double take. You have to rewind to see that over again. And ejects the other generals from the ship. Right. And then gets away. It's like, what in the heck? <laughs> he is not to be played with. Nobody at this point, as you said, it seems like can beat him. And the, you find out that he has no desire to be in charge of the Gaura Empire like right. his dad. He has no intentions of a takeover. He's got some other plans that are pretty, pretty impressive and calculating. And one is in using the, um, the, the, quintessence. the quintessence for some purposes right. we that don't... you're not sure of, but you right. know part of it is to power some ships that he's building. Right, but that's you don't, about it. You don't know what his ultimate goal is. And we see in the last episode a fake season four that he's ending up wanting to team up with not only the Voltron Paladins, but uh, the other people who were fighting yeah, the with him in the co coalition. 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 And you don't know what's going to happen. You see there's good in him, you think, because right. he helped them at the end, but did he help them because he knows his dad is so wicked and evil that he'll destroy everything and every planet and galaxy around him with no problem, and he just wanted to save the galaxy so he can... Uh, go forward with his plans or is he really have good in him and he knows that his daddy needs to be taken down because if not everything and everyone will be under his control including the planet earth right and in all of this just proves why he's pretty the number one on the list yes he's still kind of fairly new compared to the other seven villains we've listed here but he's already memorable in his own right and you probably wouldn't remember him from the 80s one because he just was not a well-made character and you shouldn't but they did do the character justice by kind of reinventing yes. the character like from the ground up they kept some designs in from the original and some key elements, mm -hmm. but they pretty much made him an entirely new character. Right. And once again, like Chase, 
and Toffee and Dominator and Azula and these other villains. He's got his own fan base. That's right. And and he and and, and now he's just this really big contender, like I said, for other uh animated animated villains. Despite him being new, he is not to be messed with. You don't know if he's gonna be he's gonna have a redemption arc or not. But whatever happens, he's pretty tough to be, whether mm -hmm. he's on the side of good or evil, whether he's an ally or a no, it says mm -hmm. he is going to be one tough one to beat. Because, like, like you said, the guard couldn't beat him. His generals couldn't beat him. His dad couldn't beat him. Voltron couldn't beat no, him. No, they couldn't. They, even when they were form Voltron, mm -hmm. he still outsmarted them. They're like, how is he doing this? Mm -hmm. Now, he's only uh, one of two uh, villains on our list that are royalty. Azula was a princess. Right. And he's a prince. And the rest aren't. But he's number one because... There's no one like him. There's no one that can beat him. He is unmatched in in relation to skills, in relation to intelligence. And as far as we know right now, he probably is the oldest out of all the villains. We're guessing that he's probably over 10,000 years old. They haven't made it clear for us. It's true. But all, all information points to... Lotor may look like he's a pretty boy teen, but I think Lotor is probably over 10,000 years old. Right. And with the 10,000 years comes a whole lot of knowledge and wisdom and just experience that he uses to his advantage, which makes him, um, for me, the biggest threat mm -hmm. and the number one spot on our best villains of the animated series. Yeah. And... Whenever this show comes back on, I know people are, are pretty much eager to know what's going to happen with this character and the rest of the series. Because as of making this, mm -hmm. um, the show is not back yet. And there's no big announcement like, for season five. Right. And just like with all these other cartoons, when people are really complaining. They said, why is everything on hiatus, including Voltron? Everything you watch is animated. People are really waiting for is on hiatus. And they may not come back till. April or spring, because that looks like the route they're going. So you're mm -hmm. stuck in limbo until they decide to. All these people decide to air their episodes, and people are really pissed off because now they, the people are saying they they gotta watch reruns or stuff on Netflix that rewatches mm -hmm. until it comes back because there's no sign of it. So this is what has to hold them until it comes back. Right. So with that, um, we're going to um, close out our podcast. I want to mention two things. One. Um, if you haven't already, we want to give a shout out to Johnny Easton. We couldn't find one for Prince Lotor. That's Johnny Easton's epic chase music, and it sounds like it should be in a blockbuster movie. Right. If you haven't visited his site, uh, go visit it. There's so much music there um, that you're going to love, and you may just want to play for your own enjoyment. Right. And secondly is our next podcast coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll be discussing Star vs. the Force of Evil cliffhanger right this will be introduced by selvion 13 yes finally so we're excited because we've been wanting to do a star versus the or forces of evil podcast yeah. but we really couldn't figure out an idea right but selvion 13 gave it to us so thank you thank you, you. <laughs> so now we finally got something to discuss about this show because we were want to talk about it for so long and trying to wait till the end of the season now i think that's gonna happen unless we gotta add whatever season three ending is to it and it's a late edition <laughs> so we'll be talking about the major cliffhangers from that show mm -hmm. our next podcast all right and that about wraps up things for us i'm Rascal entertainments and i'm mama entertainments thank you for watching and have a tuntastic day peace Rivers and streams, plucking sunlight from the sky in my pocket, giving